Remember in the prologue when we talked about the importance of not only looking at history, but who wrote it and why? In addition to being a capable staff officer, accomplished jurist, and successful politician, Richard Varick was also the man who George Washington personally chose to transcribe, to categorize, and to preserve all the documents relating to our nation's founding. But who was Varick? A man often referred to by scholars as the forgotten founding father, and why did Washington choose him to lead such an important project? That's what we will try and find out today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Richard Varick was born to Johannes Varick and Jane Day at Hackensack in Bergen County, New Jersey, on March 15, 1753. Varick was one of seven children. His ancestors arrived in the area as part of the Dutch West India Company sometime in the early to mid-1600s. We don't know much about his early life or his education. Family letters indicate numerous private tutors taught him over the years. His education appears to have been somewhat traditional. He studied languages, to be specific French and Latin, and other subjects as well, likely rhetoric, mathematics, and science. Unfortunately, that's all we know. It's possible Varric was exposed to the ideas of Locke, Voltaire, and other Enlightenment writers that would form the ideological basis of the American Revolution. By the time he was 18, Varick's family had helped him land a job clerking for John Morin Scott, one of the most prominent lawyers in New York City. After clerking with Scott for three years, the traditional amount of time, Varick was admitted to the bar. Despite claims to the contrary, he never regularly attended nor graduated from King's College, which is now Columbia University. Scott was also a leader in the New York chapter of the Sons of Liberty. Varick likely helped his boss manage the organization's affairs. He also probably came to adopt many of the beliefs of his benefactor. Varick must have made a good impression on his boss, because as soon as he was admitted to the state bar, Scott offered him a partner position at the law firm. Varick eagerly accepted. And so, Richard Varick could have faded into history being a wealthy lawyer in colonial New England. But as fate would have it, he would only practice for eight months. When the Revolutionary War began, Varick received a commission as a captain in the 1st New York Regiment on June 28, 1775. Varick never saw combat. He was no field officer. He was assigned to the staff of Major General Philip Schuyler, commander of the Northern Department, as his personal secretary. Now, before we continue, let's pause for a second and set the record straight. While it might be sexier to lead men into combat, like Daniel Morgan or Anthony Wayne did, keeping an army in the field supplied, communicating with the civilian government, and coordinating the actions of different units over a large geographic area is no easy task. Without exceptional desk officers like Varick, no army can function. While the army headed northwest towards Fort Ticonderoga, Schuyler and Varick stopped in Albany, New York. While passing through the town, Varick met and instantly befriended the then-Colonel Benedict Arnold. The two men would form a lasting political and personal friendship until Arnold's defection in 1780. General Schuyler, suffering from gout and rheumatism, joint and muscle pain, could not perform his duties, and he leaned on Varick heavily. Within a few weeks, in addition to being the private secretary to Schuyler, he was also the unofficial quartermaster for the forts occupied by the Northern Department and the Northern Army's Deputy Muster Master General. Effectively, he was the Deputy Logistics Officer. This last duty earned Varick not only Schuyler's thanks, but a big promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. 
Varric was more or less single-handedly responsible for the administration of the Northern Army, and he also provided Arnold with the men and supplies needed to build a navy to stall the British advance onto Lake Champlain. While that battle would prove to be a defeat for the Continental Navy, Varric's ability to actually get supplies and men to the lake in time should serve as a testament to his skill as an administrative officer. How often have we actually seen the Continental Army or Navy lack everything? Working together to defend Lake Champlain brought Arnold and Varric ever closer, their personal friendship deepened. Being a staff officer, Varric was forced to play the political game. He closely aligned himself with Schuyler and Arnold, the three opposed General Horatio Gates and his allies. One of Gates' men, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Walton White, angrily accused Varric of looting the home of Sir John Johnston, a wealthy loyalist, and confronted Varric in his office. I'll let the historian Arthur S. Lefkowitz take it from here. White challenged him to a duel and drew his sword on the spot and lunged towards Varric. The unarmed colonel sidestepped the thrust and fled the scene. White was arrested but managed to escape. Search parties found him sitting upon a tree stump outside Fort Ticonderoga armed with two loaded pistols and three swords. White said that he was sitting there waiting for Varric, from whom he demanded satisfaction. White faced a court-martial, but his friends intervened and arranged for his transfer to the 4th Continental Dragoons. I'd just like to point out that if you had friends in the right places in the Continental Army, you could avoid punishment for attempted murder. And who were these friends that intervened on White's behalf? One of them was General Horatio Gates, who replaced General Schuyler as commander of the Northern Army after the loss of Fort Ticonderoga in the summer of 1777. Gates and Varric were not only political rivals, they also personally loathed one another. He was also a bit unhappy that White tried to kill him. Varric wrote a fellow officer of Gates' arrival, General Gates is a happy man to arrive at this moment when General Schuyler had just paved the way to victory at Saratoga. Gates probably considered, if not actively attempted, to replace Varric with another officer. But like Gates, Varric had friends in high places too. And the disaster in the North was not Varric's fault, he was a capable staff officer. Despite their personal differences, Varric remained the Deputy Muster Master General until Congress abolished the Northern Department in January 1780. Relieved of his post and with his principal benefactor, Schuyler, out of favor, Varric returned home to Hackensack, intending to resume his law practice. This proved impossible. The British burnt much of Hackensack shortly before he arrived, and New York City was under British occupation. Varric instead served in the local militia until August of that year, when he received a letter from his friend, Major General Benedict Arnold. Arnold invited Varric to come and join him as his aide-de-camp and private secretary at West Point, New York. Varric, eager to leave Hackensack and obscurity behind, agreed to serve his friend. Varric did not know Arnold was actively communicating with General Henry Clinton to turn over West Point to the British. It's unclear exactly why Arnold would request his friend join him, knowing he was planning to defect. Remember, these men were not just political allies, they were personal friends. Arnold must have known how his defection would harm Varric's reputation. Perhaps Arnold, whose distribution of supplies at West Point had led many officers to believe he was selling them on the black market, attempted to quash any investigation and rumors of impropriety by bringing in as skilled an administrator as Varric. Maybe he thought he could convince Varric to join him. At any rate, when Arnold's betrayal came to light at the end of September, it wasn't just a military and political disaster for Varric, it was a very personal one too. Varric, ill from traveling to West Point, was on his sickbed when he was informed of Arnold's defection. He was also told he was under arrest. 
According to several contemporary accounts, he was distraught and bordered on the edge of madness for several days. Despite the fact Arnold had left behind a letter to Washington claiming his aides, Varick and David Franks, knew nothing, Washington did not want to take any chances. Even though he personally believed both men were innocent, he detained them as a precaution. Both would be acquitted unanimously by a court of inquiry. Regarding Varick, the court found that Lieutenant Colonel Varick's conduct with respect to the base peculations and treasonable practices of the late General Arnold is not only unimpeachable, but think him entitled throughout every part of his conduct to a degree of merit that does him great honor as an officer and particularly distinguishes him as a sincere friend to his country. But despite being exonerated, his reputation was in shambles. Little is known about what Varick did next for the next few months. He likely laid low, wondering how he could rebuild himself and his reputation. His answer came in the spring of 1781. Washington asked Congress for permission to hire a private secretary to compile his papers, the Continental Army papers, and Congress's transcripts. In his request, Washington wrote that this task required a man of character in whom entire confidence can be placed. When Congress consented, Washington immediately approached Varick to head the commission. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement. Washington needed a man with Varick's skills, and Varick wanted to clear his reputation. Washington likely had Varick in mind from the very beginning, by prefacing that the task required a man of character in whom entire confidence can be placed, Washington demonstrated his support and faith in Varick's absolute loyalty. Lieutenant Colonel Varick would justify the faith Washington placed in him for the next two and a half years at Poughkeepsie, New York. He and his small staff painstakingly categorized and transcribed 44 volumes worth of documents transcripts, military orders, personal correspondence, and state affairs. The Varick Transcripts, as this collection would come to be known, has been a treasure trove for historians seeking to understand America's birth. After finishing his work on the transcripts, Varick retired from the Continental Army in 1783, though he would remain in the New York State Militia until retiring as a colonel in 1801. He was one of the original members of the Society of the Cincinnati, a fraternal organization of Continental Army officers, attending its inaugural meeting in May 1783. While Varick originally intended to practice law after the war, he quickly became involved in politics. He was the recorder, or chief legal officer, of New York City from 1784 to 1789. In this capacity, he worked to establish the state of New York's very first legal code. While serving as recorder of New York City, Varick was appointed to the New York State Assembly from 1786 to 1788. He was speaker from 1787 to 1788. He was New York State Attorney General from 1788 to 1789. Despite his numerous offices, Varick finally found time to marry. He married Martha Roosevelt on May 8, 1786. The couple would not have any children. You might also reasonably ask how Varick could hold so many different positions concurrently. Well, in the decade and a half immediately after independence, New York didn't elect government officials. They were all appointed by the Council of Appointment. There was no clearly defined political or governmental structure of the new nation, Varick's skill as a jurist and administrator made him the perfect person to fill several roles during this transition. He would also serve as mayor of New York City from 1789 to 1801. During his 12 years as mayor, he formed what would become the New York City Department of Health. He was pretty heavy-handed during his tenure. Varick wanted to ensure that New York City would remain the commercial capital of the new nation while Washington, D.C., the developing nation's new official capital, was still being built. In this, he succeeded. 
a lifelong Federalist, Varick's policies were opposed by the majority of New Yorkers, who were fervent Democratic Republicans. Remember, Varick wasn't voted in, he was appointed. A mob of angry citizens almost physically ran Varick out of the city in 1794, due to his public support of the very unpopular Jay Treaty. After Varick was voted out of office in 1801, he left New York to join his friend, Alexander Hamilton, to create the associates of the Jersey Company. The company effectively built Jersey City, today the second largest city in New Jersey, through a combination of speculation and private development initiatives. He built a large home in Jersey City atop a hill overlooking the Hudson. This home, Prospect Hall, would be his residence until his death. He met and entertained many friends and colleagues from the Revolution, including the Marquis de Lafayette, during his 1824 Grand Tour of America. He was a founding member of the American Bible Society, an organization that today supports global Bible translation, production, distribution, literacy, engagement, ministry, and advocacy efforts in 1816. He was president of the society from 1828 until his death. Richard Varick died at Prospect Hall on July 30th, 1831, aged 78. He was interned at the first reformed Dutch church cemetery in his hometown of Hackensack, New Jersey. There are several reasons Richard Varick remains largely forgotten. He never saw battle. We can't conjure up a heroic image of the man, rallying his men atop his horse, saber drawn, horse rearing. He fought his war, not with shot or sword, but with ink and parchment. As much as battlefields need gifted leaders of men, armies also need resourceful administrators. Varick's legacy, even though rehabilitated by his association with Washington and his work compiling the Varick transcripts, still remained somewhat tainted in the eyes of some. Arnold's other aide, Franks, was pilloried in the Jeffersonian Republican press after the war for his alleged involvement in Arnold's defection. In 1786, Franks was fired from the diplomatic corps and, unable to find work, died in poverty. Perhaps such slanderous attacks also occurred with Varick. But Varick's most important, if perhaps most forgotten, contribution to the revolution was his preservation of the documents relating to the founding of the United States. Without these documents, it would be nearly impossible for historians to understand and interpret the founding or the founders of the United States. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the only mixed-race lieutenant colonel in the Continental Army, Joseph Lewis Cook.